Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Andreas Pumpor's Bear Slayer, um, a free translation from the unrhymed Latvian into English heroic verse. So Bear Slayer is one of the great Latvian folk narratives, epic poems, uh, passed down first through oral tradition and then written down. And uh, I want to start by mentioning that, like I would guess most non-Latvian readers, I had never read anything Latvian before this. So this was my first introduction to Latvian literature, and it's actually really quite brilliant. Um, I really enjoyed reading this quite a lot. So basically, uh, this Bear Slayer is set in the 13th century during what's known as the Northern Crusade or the Baltic Crusade, which was when a, a bunch of Christian knights, primarily from Germany, but some also from France, some from elsewhere in Eastern Europe, um, went on a crusade into the Balkans, Latvia, Estonia, uh, places like this, or, sorry, into the Baltic region, uh, Latvia and Estonia and places like this, to kill or convert the last pagans remaining in Europe. Um, so the Baltic peoples remained pagan much longer than almost anyone else in Europe. Um, and in the 12th century, uh, there was a crusade to, to destroy this, uh, this last bastion of paganism. And so in the book, the, pay, the, the Christians are the villains, the pagans are the heroes, uh, which is really fascinating to read a medieval European poem in which the Christians are the bad guys, because it's so different than every other piece of medieval literature I've ever encountered. Uh, but basically you have this hero named Bear Slayer, and he's, he's called Bear Slayer because uh, when he's a young man, about 18 or so, um, a bear attacks his father in the woods, and Bear Slayer grabs the bear by its jaws and basically destroys this bear with his bare hands. Um, at which point we find out that uh, he is actually not that guy's son. He was brought by a, uh, a soothsayer, uh, having been found in the woods being suckled by a bear, um, and told... Uh, and this guy who who uh, Bear Slayer thought was his father uh, raised Bear Slayer uh, as though he were his son. And it's revealed to Bear Slayer that he's going to be a great hero who protects the Latvian people over the course of uh, the epic poem. Bear Slayer has a number of adventures, most of them uh, involving supernatural characters whether that's witches or whether that's demons, whether that's weird sort of maybe uh, vampires, um, whether that's the gods, the devil is here extensively. Um, and so the larger framework of the narrative is about the, uh, initially the uh, emergence or the, the, the entrance of German Christians into Latvia and their sort of gradually increasing presence, um, which Bear Slayer has to resist. And what, so the, the Latvian gods are very much uh, opposed to this, uh, to the, the emergence of Christianity here. Um, and so in the first scene of the first canto, uh, we have a, a meeting of the gods, and Perkons, wrote, uh, Perkons speaks. Perkons is sort of the main god who uh, supports Bear Slayer. He's, he's a god of thunder, so in that way he's somewhat like Thor, somewhat like Zeus, maybe. Um, but almost like Athena in the Odyssey, he takes a special interest in Bear Slayer and protects him throughout his journey. So it says here, Now Perkons rose, his strength at last to wield, and spoke. 
Immortal and almighty both, yet still the gods to destiny's will must yield. But nonetheless I offer here this oath. In my strong care the Latvian folk I hold, and all good teachings here permit to stand. Though good, Christ's message clearly yet is old, and from the east these teachings reach our land. But those who bear his message to our shores have come to us to serve a different view. To conquer Baltic regions is their cause, to make our people slaves their purpose new. I will oppose their plans against our folk, and surely as I split this mighty rock or shake asunder trees of stoutest oak, this gold the Baltic folk will surely mock. So here we have this really interesting distinction that Perkons is making between um, the message of Christ and the Christians themselves. Uh, so the, he says the message of Christ is good, but the Christians are bad. The Christians are trying to come and enslave uh, the Latvian pagans force them to convert, steal their land, steal their resources, etc., etc. Oh, how many colonized peoples could sympathize. But the really fascinating thing for me about the, uh, the Christians here is that even unintentionally, they end up being satanic. Because uh, the devil shows up a lot in this poem. Uh, the devil's a kind of interesting figure in this poem because he kind of he works through human or semi-human, say witches and things like this, uh, agents rather than doing much himself. But in uh, in one section we have a witch's coven that meets and they they summon demons and have sex with them. They summon the devil. And they bring in this guy named Kangars, um, who's a, a hermit. He's supposed to be a holy man, but we find out that he had served the devil and then renounced the devil to become a uh, Latvian pagan holy man. But he's brought before the devil, and he basically agrees to work for the devil once again in exchange for a long life. And so uh, what it says here is a moment's thought and Lucifer began in vain you're begging, but my urgent plight could save your life and further time ensure. The faith of Perkons yields a harvest light, a daunting task their souls to us to lure. A gift of fortune that to Baltic lands a foreign force is coming from the West that seeks to seize the Baltic in its hands. To plant an alien faith, this is their quest. I too desire to see that faith sown free because its growth will yield a harvest sure. For many priests already cleave to me, the bearers of the faith, whom all think pure. This task I give you, help that faith to come and spread it wide upon the Baltic shore. So the devil wants the Baltic converted to Christianity because it's easier for the devil to get Christians to, um, to become satan worshippers than it is for him to convert followers of perkons and the pagan faith so the christians end up being the unwitting accomplices of the devil which again i just i love the irony of it so different my cat is messing around in my stuff over here uh that's frank's butt uh, but I just, I love how different this is from every other medieval text I've read where the Christians are the good guys. It's su such a fascinating difference. But the other big thing that I sort of did as I was reading Bear Slayer is I, I played a game of sort of spot the similarities. Because one of the things about epic poetry from the ancient medieval and medieval world is that there are a lot of common tropes, common images, common occurrences, things that happen uh, that are similar to things that happen in other epic poems um, or, or folk narratives. So I'm going to just go through some of these. And I, I want to make it clear, first off, that I, I'm not claiming that these are influences. 
So I'm not saying that um, Bear Slayer is is based on any of these things or or directly adapts any of these things. Some of these things are definitely written well later than Bear Slayer, so they clearly couldn't be, but there's similarities. So uh, the first thing uh, that I, one of the things that I was thinking about is heroes, particularly human heroes or, or demigods with a human parent uh, with superhuman strength, because that's what we have with Bear Slayer, with the character of Bear Slayer, is he has superhuman strength. So characters like Heracles and Achilles, Cuchulain, Samson, Beowulf, and Gilgamesh and Enkidu all spring to mind as other heroes or other characters that have these supernatural strengths. Uh, there's going to... Frank, can you... I'm sorry. Uh, can you just go that way? Yeah. So there's going to be a lot more uh, in here, but these are things that... Um, these are the, the things that I sort of identified as similar to other things. So at the beginning of Canto 2, when Bear Slayer kills the bear, that's Davy Crockett, right? For anybody who watched the old uh, 50s and 60s Davy Crockett with Fess Parker, uh, one of the lines from the, the theme song is he killed him a bar when he was only three. Here we have a child killing a bear. So we, we have Davy Crockett right off the bat, uh, this great American mythic folk hero. Um, but then we have this section uh, called Bear Slayer's Origins are Revealed, and the first two stanzas are Full 18 years ago this very day, a little boat ran upon the land, and from it stepped a sage both old and gray, who, who held secure an infant in his hand. Though aged still the youthful step he strode, my task in fate's great purpose soon laid bare, to take this sturdy boy to my abode and raise him, teach him, and train him as my heir. This sage was Validots, sent by the gods to tell me deep within the forest wild a human babe was found against all odds, and that a she-bear's milk sustained the child. For him, as told, it is, it is the gods' firm will to be a hero and to strive for right. His name, the fear, the, uh, his name with fear, the wicked heart will fill, and evil evildoers trembling put to flight. So we've got a number of things here. This idea of uh, the sage both old and gray who delivers a child to be raised by someone else that's Arthur and Merlin uh, the the little boat ran up on land bringing the child that's Moses uh, in the reeds being being uh, found by Pharaoh's daughter and then this idea of a human babe uh, sustained by bear's milk this is Romulus and Remus I mean, they, as as babies, were raised by a a wolf, uh, and they they fed from uh, her breast milk. So we've got those connections. Um, later on, we have the introduction of uh, Bear Slayer's best friend Cognesis, uh, who basically like. Bear Slayer is paddling this ferry across a river, and the paddle breaks because of how strong he is. And the people panic because they're like, oh, we're being swept down the river. And Bear Slayer basically swims them across. Like, he uses his hands as paddles. This guy named Cognesis sees this great feat of strength, and he, he basically is like, ah, I've ripped this tree up out of the ground because I am also incredibly strong. I've come from the woods where I regularly just rip trees up to build whatever kind of thing. Um, so that's Enkidu from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, it's someone who comes from the wilderness and can match the main, can match the hero, the protagonist in strength. Um, we've got a similar kind of event, a similar kind of kind of relationship. In this section called Bear Slayer defeats Calipuesis and befriends him. 
Because Calapuesis is an Estonian giant who the villains bring in to try and defeat Bear Slayer so that they can conquer the Latvians. Bear Slayer and Calapuesis have this epic battle. Um, and then Calapuesis is basically like, hey man, uh, you've defeated me fair and square. Let's be friends and I will help watch your back. So again, we've got that Gilgamesh and Enkidu kind of relationship where a character comes from the wilderness fights the protagonist i mean i mean the other guy um Cognesis doesn't doesn't fight bear slayer but calipuesis fights bear slayer and as with the battle between gilgamesh and enkidu that's what creates their friendship so we've got that similarity uh as well we've got this section uh Bear Slayer is in a sunken castle. There's a couple of sunken castles that Bear Slayer raises to the, the surface of lakes. Um, but in one of them, he has to, to fight some demons. And we've got sort of a vampire here. Um, it says, In all the rooms a sudden whirlwind ran, and seven demon fiends rushed through the door. They bore a coffin with an ancient man, like scythes his teeth, like knives the nail he, nails he bore. Although at first he seemed, it seemed that he was dead, he moved himself and uttered ghastly groans. With opened eyes, how cold I am, he said, and unwish, an unwished shudder gripped Bear Slayer's bones. And basically, Bear Slayer holds this guy in the fire, and then has to defeat the... Uh, the witch Spidala, who initially he had been in love with until he found out that she was a witch, and these seven demons. Um, and that's how Bear Slayer raises that castle to the, the surface. Um, next, the next one I found is in uh, this section called The Story of the Creation, which is interesting because we have... Um, we have God spoken about in the singular, so it's not real clear whether this is some version of the Christian God or whatever it is, because this uh, Perkons doesn't seem to be a creator God, but he's the main God who's discussed elsewhere in the epic poem. Um, but basically, this is a, a really fascinating one because um Basically, God, God and the devil are hanging out. Um, and the devil's not evil at this point, but he's sort of like, eh, you know what? I could maybe, I could maybe be like on the same plane as God. So God tells the devil to go down and get some primordial ooze. And the devil is like, ah, primordial ooze. That seems good. I'm going to hide some of that in my cheek uh, so that I can, you know, make stuff too. And then God uses the primordial ooze. Uh, it says he he cried earth form and flat planes uh, develop. But the, the primordial ooze in the devil's mouth uh, forms as well. And he has to spit it out and that makes mountains. Um, God creates dogs and the devil creates wolves and th things like this. It's kind of a weird whole bit here. Um, but then it says, at last God chose to make the human race. To do this from the earth he took pure clay. One eye and ear alone possessed the face, though arms and legs the body could display. No evil see, nor hear, nor do, he praised, and walk a righteous path avoiding strife. True virtue show from endless Godhead raised, with his own breath then breathed it into life. The human being slept while breathing light, here wait for morning, God contented spoke. The rising sun will wake you from the night. The morning sun into the world awoke. Of all creations, yet this one, the one most fine. With freedom's spirit filled and, fr and with free will. So noble that it strives to grow divine, to seek the good the highest goals fulfill. But now the fiend God's creatures would enslave, 
and in the night another ear and uh, or another eye and ear another nostril to the human gave and of his essence breathed in hate and fear then said now evil can you see and speak and henceforth not just lofty good will know but stumbling helpless blind the path will seek and good and evil both directions go so we've got a weird creation of humanity story here because it it has elements of the biblical creation story the creation of human beings out of clay god breathing life into them um humanity having free will but also being in a sort of state of innocence and then the devil coming along to tempt them but it's it's a it's clearly a different kind of uh, situation here because God creates one-eyed, one-eared, one-nostrilled people and the devil gives us, you know, this whole face shape with with two of these things. So it's it's an interesting twist on the biblical creation story um the next thing almost immediately after this we have this interesting bit where it's a sort of existentialist thing where it's like every human is going to die but humanity will go on which is interesting because that's one reading of the end of the gilgamesh epic poem um so we've got that sort of that sort of end here presented in a different way. Frank, what are you doing? Sorry, my cat. I don't know if he saw a bug or if he's just I don't know, being paranoid. Anyway, uh so we've got a couple more things here. Uh interestingly enough, um Lam Dota, whose bear slayer is true love. Uh, gets kidnapped by the Germans and sent to a monastery. And interestingly, she we have a sort of reversal of this story that's that's fairly common in Christian hagiography. Because um, often you have young, beautiful, saintly women who uh, get kidnapped or are, are going to be raped by an undesirable pagan partner uh not partner but you know what i mean an undesirable pagan uh who wants to marry them or enslave them as a sex slave or whatever it is here we have it reversed where the the young beautiful virtuous pagan is brought to a nunnery but an earl a Chris, christian earl uh basically tries to kidnap her and rape her um We've got this section where Bear Slayer tries to go and rescue Lamdota. Um, and it says, Bear Slayer in this boat sailed on the northern sea to Germany afloat to set Lamdota free. But battered by the force of wind and storm that blew and, and lost far from the course the way no more they knew. It seemed that evil powers, sea ghosts, were ever near. In day and nighttime hours, they filled the crew with fear. So this is an extended journey through a number of islands and mystical lands and things like this, which is basically the premise of the Odyssey. And later on, the North Wind's daughter brings them to a sort of supernatural paradise, which is somewhat like the island of Calypso in the Odyssey. Um... Later on, after, Beowulf, or after Bear Slayer returns home, he has to fight these three demons. The first has three heads, the second has six heads, and the third has nine heads. And th I mean, this is a, a vague connection, but that sort of three combats structure is somewhat similar um, to what we see in Beowulf. Um, this idea of three combats, even though that takes place over the entirety of the Beowulf narrative, and here it's condensed into basically one scene. We also have this interesting element of Bear Slayer that he has bear's ears, 
which doesn't come up until almost the end of the poem, which seems like something maybe worth mentioning earlier on. But um, it says, A mother bear, bear slayer bore, the babe a holy hermit sired. His mother's line gave strength, but more. Through her the youth bear's ears acquired. And if opponents can prevail in both his ears... Frank, there's nothing there. Uh, and both his ears slice off with speed, his mighty power at once will fail. Enough, go now, no thanks I need. So here we have Samson, except instead of hair, it's bear's ears. So, you know, uh, if you cut off bear slayer's ears, uh, his power is gone, which makes perfect sense. Um, toward the end, at the almost at the end of the poem, um, Bear Slayer fights the Black Knight, who manages to cut off his ears. But the Black Knight and Bear Slayer are locked in, in mortal combat, and they tumble from these cliffs into the Dogava River. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I, I don't know this river. Um, and it's Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty at Reichenbach Falls. The two mortal enemies locked in combat who then fall to their doom. But is it their doom? Yes, it is their doom. But it's also uh, a complex doom because we have here a couple of bits at the end. Um, it says, but still, though ages long passed by, the grieving folk his memory keeps. For them in death he does not lie, but in a golden palace sleeps. Below the island risen there, he lies within the Dogva's breast. With uh, with Latvia's folk their fate to share, and close to Lilovar de rest. That's his, his castle and his father's name. And then the last bits of the poem, it says, But still the day will come is sure, when he the Black Knight will cast down. In Staburag's raging maw, his deadly foe alone will drown. Then for the folk new times will dawn, at last their freedom will be born. So what we have here in Bear Slayer's watery death is or semi-death, is Bear Slayer as Arthur gone to Avalon, the once and future king, uh, the one who will return when his people need him most. So it's a fascinating poem. I really, really recommend it. Um, not only is it an interesting story, that this translation um, but, uh, I forget who it's translated by. Uh, Arthur Copley, or Cropley, sorry, Arthur Cropley. Uh, this translation is really, really easily readable. It's a fascinating poem.